Well, good evening. Thank you very much for asking me back to talk. In some ways, this talk is a follow-on from the previous one I did about the two student hostels in Oxford, by Stirling and by the Smithsons. But this time, as part of our post-war architect series, I'm going to talk about um, just about James Stirling, and in particular about two two schemes of his, that both of which I've been to and seen quite a while back, and and have thought about since. First one is the School of Architecture at Rice University in Houston, Texas, which is quite a modest, modest alteration to existing building and an addition. And the second one is the Braun factory at Melsungen in Germany, which was a large industrial complex and in fact probably the last building that Sterling did. In talking about these two buildings, I'm going to refer back as with the hostels <laughs> to the relationship between post-war architects and Le Corbusier and I'm also going to bring out some points about the effect of World War II on people, architecture and life in, in, in general because we're now about 80 years on from that and we're 20 years on from the death of uh, Sterling. Uh, just to recap, some of you will know this sort of thing but I ought to set the context a little bit. James Sterling was born in Glasgow, son of a marine engineer. He studied at Liverpool University where the presence of Colin Rose, a fellow student, explains a lot of things about James Sterling's work. When he came down to London, he was involved with the, on the, the edges of the independent group and took part in the Sister uh, Morrow exhibition. So the sort of network of younger post-war architects who had served in the military and had taken part in World War II. At Lowndes, as known as, he met James Gowan. Between them, they set up practice based on this uh, block of flats they did in Ham Common. They then went on to numbers of local buildings, and also, most famously, the Leicester University Engineering Building, um, set up on their own. After this, the Cambridge Building, History Building, their ways split. I won't go into it in detail, but because it's been covered quite well by Mark Crinson, went his own, own way. After that, the Olivetti Training School, we've had a talk here recently on that, and then on t into uh, his partnership with Michael Wilford, a lot of work in Germany. And here in yellow, you can see at the bottom the two buildings that I'm going to talk about in 79, the School of Architecture at Rice University, and later on, in the early 90s, the Brown Factory, Mount Sungen. In, 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 in the 50s, um, this, is, this is a double-page spread from Architects Yearbook, number eight, <laughs> edited by Trevor Dannett in the mid-50s, an article by Sterling talking about regionalism and clearly the, the, you, you couldn't live or study in Liverpool without being aware of this. this I hate to put the word tradition on it, but it's, it, it, it is the industrial buildings of the 19th century and earlier, these extremely robust, formally inventive and vigorous, strong-formed I won't use the word vernacular because they aren't. They're, they're, they're for particular purposes. But these very strong, forceful buildings that you could not avoid being impressed by, and Sterling clearly, clearly was. These are two images of the Leicester University building in 59-63. Two photos by Richard Einzig, almost the same angle, black and white and coloured. But I thought to put the two of them together because they look the same, but they're not actually the same if you look from one to the other you can clearly see that the, this building is made up of a large number of different forms <laughs> and shapes and functions and was quite, was probably, the, at this time I would have been a student, I think, in my final year and I remember everybody's, it was an intake of breath, okay, the, the effect of this building. And in hindsight, really what was important about this building was the use of bricolage, Bricolage is, is a word used by the Cubists for uh, when, early, well, various waves of Cubists, but that when they introduced, as well as looking at things from different angles within the same picture plane, they also applied pieces of material, like a piece of wallpaper or veneer or a cutting from a newspaper, just cut out and stuck in amongst the painted part of their multiple visions of the world confined to its little rectangular canvas. <laughs> this is what's happening here really, that the forms you're seeing here, you can see the, the low level laboratories with the diagonal roof lights running across and expressed as diamonds on the, on the elevations. The two lecture theatres at right angles to each other, 
asymmetrical, unlike um, Melnikov's original uh, constructivist forms. The entrance with the, with the, the engineering brick, the, the two types of laboratory that are there, the fact that it being a teaching building, it involves the use of making and putting things together. The, on the top of the tower, there's the water tank, and the height of the water tank determines the height of the building because of the pressure of the water as it's used industrially inside. Thing. So the whole building is made up from the brief, from the engineering department, what they wanted, uh, interpreted in this very rich formal language. I've got a note there, I think, which says the forms are rem reminiscent of machines. You know, there are, there are flues from, from, from ships serving functions and assembled so as to draw attention to the rhetoric of them so that the group expression is greater than the sum of its parts. And it's that that caused people problems, I think, that people immediately recognised these parts and said, why the hell do you have these bits of parts? Why, why stick them together? What, you know, are they that, is, this, is this shape of this thing as important as that shape of the other thing? So there was quite a, the, the, the argument spread by this stemmed from this building. I'm going to jump back in time now, and this is leading up to the other building, the, the, the building of the library in Rice that um, I'm going to talk about in a minute. In 1923, uh, Leon Ransburg had brought the Dutch distilled people to Paris and put on a show between October the 15th and November the 15th, 1923, in, in Paris. It was really driven by Theo van Doesburg and van Esten, who produced model schemes, worked by Aud Reitfeld, Mies, but mainly Reitfeld. Reitfeld was very much involved in this exhibition. And here's a picture of what they put. A series of drawings and models of prospective buildings. One real live building, the Schroeder House, which I have talked to you about, all as exemplars of the Distill Group's ideas. The core of this thing was, was Van Dersberg and Corvin Esten, their, their Maison d'Artiste, which was a sort of three-dimensional house that actually worked, but was made up, uh, drawn in axonometric and made in a physical model by Reitveld, where planes were clearly abstract clay, uh, planes, <laughs> rectangular ones, floated free, which you could do in an axonometric drawing and you could do I in a model. The, the where whole buildings there, there was a large house that they were trying to sell to somebody that never got built here at the right. At this time, in the summer, and, and earlier actually, uh, Le Corbusier had been resting with and designing what ended up as being the La Roche House, which was a house for the uh, Swiss banker uh, who collected cubist and purist paintings, and for his cousin, cousin and his wife. So it was two houses. It, it, it was on a plot of a backlands plot in an inner suburb of Paris. So it's a backland plot surrounded by six story, the usual six story blocks you get in, 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 in Paris. And it's a piece of backland, but on one side there was access through with a road in the middle to the backland. And there was a site which had all the back gardens running onto it with this road. And what you see here is a sc the scheme that, that Corbusier done house in September of 23. Which, which has got basically two houses, one here for, for uh, his cousin and his wife, Buddy Ruff, uh, and on the other side, the, the house for La Roche, the collector, with his, his, his paintings. It's very constricted. That the fact that this is the road that comes from the outside down the middle, and this is the north elevation, uh, south on the other side, but the, it sits back onto the boundary walls of of the back gardens of the surrounding blocks on this side and on this side there are some over this side not quite so near but there are restrictions in where you could have windows for overlooking and on height and Corbusier was acting as a, as a, as a, as a, a state agent he, he had to get the financial deals for the plot to be bought and get all clients to put their, their piece in to get the thing done anyway uh, at, at that time it looked like this now, this is a model of the La roche Genre house during the summer of 1923, before the exhibition in the autumn of, of the Distill work. I'm, I'm showing you this because you can see that at that time, the house for the two people, it was fairly blocky. It had Corbusier motifs like the uh, Fenetre Longue. What it has basically is that La Roche's house is at the end here, and his cousin's house was at, at this end here, the two houses joining, in the middle where these garages are. Now, when the distill exhibition came on, an awful lot of people see it, and, 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 it, and, and it, it caused quite a stir amongst 
a, a, a number of people. I mean, people who saw it would have been uh, Jean Badovici, who was editing Architecture Vivant and a promoter of Corbusier at that time, together with Eileen Gray and Christian Zervos, the Greek man who financed uh, L'Architecture Vivant and later on the, the Siam conference to, to Greece. I'm going to show you now how the, the La Roche house ended up. This is a view of plans at four levels of the La Roche part of the house at the end, which, as you remember from the model, was rather blocky and L-shaped at this end. Later on in 1923, having experienced the Distill exhibition and absorbed it or reacting to it, uh, Corbusier certainly um, he loosened up. <laughs> and we can see here that the gallery part of the building for La Roche, which was that rectangle you saw in the model on the ground, has been lifted up. It's lifted up on Pilotti, uh, and this is the first floor level, where it, instead of being rectangular, it has a curved wall with a, with a ramp. So it's become a much more plastic form, not particularly distilled, but, but uh, you can see in the photo on the right, that's the interior of the gallery showing the, 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 the ramp and the, and the curved wall. The entrance to it here was still in the same position, and, and, and it's the entrance area and the hall that I really want to draw your attention to. You enter straight in off the side here into a three-storey volume, which is square in plan, with a completely blank wall on at least one surface of it, and a large amount of blank wall, uh, as you can see in this photo down here. Um, you, you, you come in underneath through the door here, and you're in the hall here, and here's one of the paintings on display, on one of these, these walls. There's a staircase in the corner that leads up with a, a half landing that protrudes into the entrance space, which you can see here in this, this photo there, and then it links through at first door level to the, 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 the raised gallery with this ramp at the far corner, and the whole thing is an architectural promenade through a space to view the paintings and, and experience them. You end up on the top floor with a library for La Roche, a bachelor with a banker bachelor <laughs> with a, a well-to-do income. So, and that library sits at the top there, overlooking this three-story space below. So, to move on a bit, this is a photograph by Richard Parr, a, a contemporary photograph, almost the same as the black and white one, which was from uh, complete. And what, what you can see here, and what he says is good for you, he does stress this, is the fact of the, the way the walls to the what were rooms, but are now actually spaces, are, are, are abstracted. That you get what is the balustrade to the balcony here, but when you're down below here, that is a flat, abstract plane. At the top here, where the library is, behind what is also a balustrade, but is in the same plane as the rest of the wall, and therefore, when you're down here and you don't know it, um, becomes an abstract plane across the top here. You don't know what, but it, it stops before the ceiling, and, and, and there's a roof light that throws light down. There's indirect light seeping in from various places, mainly with this large north facing roof light, so you don't get direct sunlight. So it's basically an overall soft light, but what that ensures is that you've got a large number of different shaped rectangular planes. This is the original with a picture in it, so you can see where the pictures hang. But this is the, the opposite view, the other side of the hall. What you see in the foreground of this photo is, is the balustrade on this side of the, of the space, which is here. And it runs up three, three, three levels. And again, the balustrades vary in height and merge with the rest of the wall. So they are abstract rectangular planes with holes in them. And as you can see, to, to conform with the safety regulations, balustrade and things, you get these very thin rods here, which, which don't interrupt the visual, the visual invention that's going on here. And on the final side here, this enormous wall, which is the most abstracted of the lot. This again is a Richard Parr photo. The, the main wall at the back, which of course is plain because of the regulations for not overlooking um, or being seeing in from, from the neighbours, becomes, uh, as you're moving up here, you do not see the ends of it, all right? It's become a, a large abstract plain. And this is what, this is not like uh, 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 Van Doesberg or anybody else, it's directly. But the, 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 the liberation to be able to think in this way with space and to find it in planes like this was the important thing that happened with this building. Now, I know we're quite a long way from Jim Sterling and 
Texas. But anyway, to go, uh, to move forward to Rice University in, in, in Houston. Rice University is, is, is a well-endowed uh, college in, in Houston, and it has a campus layout done in the uh, a version of American uh, Beaux-Arts architecture by, by Graham Goodhue and Ferguson uh, just after the turn, turn, turn of the century. It, it has a sort of layout which is a campus layout with a sort of ring road with these buildings and, and, and arcades scattered around it. What you were looking at before, there's a rather grand building that, that's here. The School of Architecture that Sterling got to do, there, there, there existed already this building here and this building here, and he designed an L-shaped building that went on the corner of, of that building there. And this is a plan of that at larger scale, so you can see this, this, this arcade that you can see that they've got with this sort of campus uh, bazaar arrangement there, which is there at, at the other layout. This is an existing building along this side here. The new L-shaped building, you see, this is the ground floor of it, L-shaped in this form here. And so you enter it through a courtyard on the side, on the diagonal, you enter it there and there. And what Sterling did was he just, uh, he designed the, the, the buildings of, of, of this entrance. The, the functions of this entrance are actually that of quite a few architectural schools. It reminds me, as, and as an organisation actually, so I'm going to explain its organisation now, it's quite like uh, at Bath, building 6E by the Smithsons there, the, the, the entrance part of it where you come in off the walkway and you have a large space where, you, where you've entered the school where you sort of orientate yourself, which is big, where you can have gatherings of different sorts and different sizes and that you can also have slightly off it areas in which you can do crits that for people who have put their schemes up and they can be discussed and they can be there either for, for, for individual tuition or for bigger gatherings where people talk about a subject. So what you get here on the ground floor, where you can see it hatched here, is an entrance area that is flexible in its use. And you can see it's got two rectangular volumes, one this side where you just come in, one the, the, uh, the other side that can be divided off, and then there's a little lecture there. And at either end, there are these semicircular apses. These semicircular apses rise through the full two, three height stories of the building and have canal lumiere, to use a Corbusian motif, at, at either end of them. But this one there and there. This is a view of the outside of that. Uh, and what I'm describing there is, you've this is the back of the building. You've entered it from the other side there. There's part of a lecture theatre here. Uh, inside there's that passage that runs up and down. Uh, here are the canal lumiere that, that, that Sterling did, where you have these roof lights quite high up, then a volume in which the light above reflects above the surface of the ceiling and the, the internal surface of these cylindrical ones are coloured, pale sort of lime green as if I remember it, and then a sort of pink colour. Right, to show, I um, hope I can describe this a bit better here now. Here's an axonometric of what's going on here. Here's the entrance hall, here is a, a canal lumiere over a space at the end, and here's a canal lumiere over a space at the end here. Now, in between, there's a double height space here, which is the big hall you've just come into. There is a bridge that links the, the levels above. You reach the bridge by two staircases, one on each side, and the staircases are s symmetrical, and about that, beyond that, there's a meeting space beyond. The, the way the staircases are put together, they're done, again, reminiscent of La Roche, in that they're dogleg staircases with solid balustrades of flat rectangular planes. And as you proceed up a staircase, your, your views are obscured and revealed in the same way that... La Roche works. Uh, here's a, a photo of, of, of a staircase. That if you're going up that staircase, you can't see out of it for part of it, and other parts you can see out and feel the whole space. In the middle here, there's three showing different layouts for the overall thing, that if you're having exhibitions and stuff, you can open up the middle bit and the middle bit there, or you can close up on the top here where you can have individual crits going on, or you can open out and have a gallery over uh, a lecture theatre either way. So, it, so it's a flexible space for teaching, and that's what this photo show, shows you here. Uh, I've shown this in a bit bigger detail to show you really what's going on here, because it's the scale of these spaces and the way that the planes are used, the, the, the abstract nature of them, that goes directly back to the, the Maison de Roche. It, it, it's the same thing going on in, on, on in this school, and it works for a teaching environment rather than a sort of gallery environment. These planes are abstract, okay? I'll put the two side by side, okay? They're 50 years apart, and 
one is renowned and the other less, less, less well known. The, I, I haven't got any good photos of how the Canal Lumiere work at the ends. This gives you absolutely no idea whatsoever, I'm sorry. But, but in reality, where you see the round circle here is a sort of vibrating pale light that suffuses through the spaces beyond and is, I think, very beautiful. At the time this building was finished, um, Philip Johnson is famous for having said he couldn't find the place at all. <laughs> when, he, when he visited Rise, he couldn't get there, so he never saw it, which maybe is more a comment on him than anything else. Can I leave that hanging in the air? Because I'm now going to go on to another piece of history, if you like, architectural history, again from uh, Le Corbusier. And this is to do with something at a completely different scale. At the end of World War II, when the Germans retreated before the Battle of the Bulge up through northeastern France, they ravaged what was left behind. I mean, the hill that Ranchamp was on, the existing chapel on that, that was a lookout post, was blown up. In Sandy, the nearest, they blew up one whole sector of Sandy. This is a photograph of Sandy looking, you can see here the Vosges mountains rising up above. There's the Meurthe River that runs through the middle. And this area of, of in, in the centre of Sandy, the Germans mined and blew up over a period of three days and three nights. They systematically blew everything up, destroyed everything that was in this area. The only thing that stayed was the cathedral and its cloister back at, back at the end here. Uh, the rest of the town over here, I think, was sort of, and, and they re re retreated from that. Here's a plan of that, the River Murph, the hills above here, the cathedral, the area that was completely destroyed here. I'm showing you this planning scheme that Corbusier suggested for this. It's one of, he did many planning schemes at different scales, and they're a whole subject to talk about. But the main thing about, about a planning study, of course, is that it takes time to happen. It's not like, say, adding an extension to a building as we've just seen in Texas, uh, done over a really short period of time. If you're rebuilding a, c a city, it takes time, and clearly, copies none of them got built, <laughs> um, except for Shandigar in the end. So they, they exist as ideas on paper, and I'm showing you some D because it, the important thing about it actually was that when published in Oeuvre Complete and seen by everybody, the, all these architects who'd been studying or not studying or not architecting during the war and came out after the war and then practiced, this thing was, was in front of them. The thing about Sandy is that it deals with the fourth dimension. It deals with time. Uh, and you can see that in, in this drawing here where you've got an orientation north point and how the sun moves. You've also got the distance you can travel in quarter of an hour. This is quarter of an hour's walking equals this distance here. So the scale of this plan is related to a known walking scale. If you like, okay, it takes you a quarter of an hour to cover that sort of distance. And therefore, if you think of that in times of covering distances, in the, re the green part is the reconstructed and Corbusier's scheme on the side of the River Sunday, and, and on the other side there's the, the town and the circulation which, which existed before. It's a, it's a planning scheme that relates to the landscape and, and to time in use. And, and because of that, I think it's one of the most convincing and interesting is, I mean, there, there are formal ideas in all these planning schemes that are interesting, but the fact that the ideas never became realities diminishes them in a bit. This uh, is an idea, but never became reality, but the idea is so rooted in this notion of, of time and space uh, at that time in 1945. Here, here you can see the red is the, the layout of the, the fast roads, uh, the yellow, the orange, which is distributor roads for cars, for use within the city itself, and the yellow, which is a sort of central area for civic buildings in the centre. Here's the various things that you get in the centre of the town, town hall, museum, hotel, shop, all these things are, are, are suggested. It never got built, this scheme, but you can see the clear idea. This is uh, 1950, Sterling, as a student, did a scheme for I, a, a new, new, new towns for the thing in post-war period, and like lots of people, the scheme at Sandy did strike home the scale and the time of how you put together civic buildings in spaces, and he, and he was absorbed, and, and it's quite an interesting scheme that he did at that time. So it was part of his education and comprehension. I'm going to talk now, again, um, before we get to another building, <laughs> by a piece of post-war because not only did the Germans uh, destroy things in their retreat, also in the Allied advance. This is the Alta Pinoteca Gallery in Munich, 
right, in, in, in Germany, which was bombed in the summer of 1945. The Alte Pinotek by Leo von Kainz was, I would say, a rip-off, but it's a copy of the Dulwich Art Gallery, basically, is an art gallery. It was a series, series of galleries, top-lit, with smaller galleries to the side. You, you entered it at one end, and on the south side, where it was very sunny, you go up a staircase at the end, and you went along an arcade that, was, that had the sun coming into it before going into the main galleries. And I said, it's, it's not like Dulwich in that sense, but organisation, it's inspired by Dulwich. What happened when it got bombed was the bomb fell bang in the middle of the side here and demolished the corridor part uh, of, of the galleries this side. You can see there what, what, where it, what it was before and what happened uh, in 1945. It was slowly put back together again by Hans Dolgast between 40, over a long period of time. They rebuilt, the, this, this is the plan, I'm sorry, it's the reverse of the plan you saw before, but the part that was bombed it was rebuilt as a pair of staircases going off uh, so that instead of it just be, instead of there being a staircase as it was originally at the the end, you went up and then along a long corridor. You entered ground floor on the opposite side in the middle to foyer here, where you're received, and then you go up to the galleries either way, up this, these staircases. This is an intermediate a photo. That going, this is before the staircases are built. It's with the new roof going over the top. The bomb part filled in with columns rising up, holding the roof above. The two staircases there. Uh, don't yet exist, nor do the gallery bit the side. So it was put up like that, and then eventually the staircases were built at the side. I've got one, if you can imagine this photo mirrored over here, you come in the entrance hall here, and you get this staircase here, and then behind you over here, the same thing happening at this side, up to an arcade above. And here's the, uh, there's the south-facing arcade. So the, the circulation space to this gallery, series of galleries that you get once you've come up, Once you've come up, you, you arrive, you, you, you go up the staircase and it's lit on both sides and then you're off into the galleries as, as at Dulwich and you see the pictures there. So it's not looking at pictures here. This is an architectural, it's a reforming of, of the route through the building that's made possible as a result of the bomb damage. And this is a chap like me who's really enjoying the architectural space that you get with this effect. This is about 260 metres long, this space. <laughs> that's the way into a gallery and it, and it is quite an experience. Um, I'll leave that hanging there. These are a couple of books. Uh, the 9H book dealt with Dolcast work there, this factory, uh, at this time. It also dealt with the Messelungen factory, which I'm going to come on to now, which was also written about by Bob Maxwell just after it was built in the 1990s. And the Dolcast thing was, was noted and written up again in the, in, in the 1990s. Later on, Mark Crinson dug into Dame Sterling's Black Book, which is his study of that. Which This is Sterling studying copies. It's in the Swiss Pavilion in Paris. That's Sterling sitting there, hang a rest. Uh, and Crinson's other book on Sterling Guy clearly went through all, all the problems that Sterling himself had uh, with Corbusier, and it re records those very well, and I recommend them. I'm now going on to this last building that he did, which is this factory, the Brown factory in Melsungen in Germany. And this is a picture of Bob Maxwell with Jim Sterling, who died a year later after this, um, walking along um, a, a corridor in this factory building, which is um, about 260 metres long. And I'll explain a bit about it as we go along. The Braun factory are a firm who make uh, medical equipment and medicine things it, which are quite specialised in that the, you have con different types of drugs that are put together within containers that are in different ways so that they're used for various medical procedures in the right order uh, by a very sophisticated technique. So they're, they're materials and chemicals that are brought together and packaged and then distributed in various volumes and sizes. And they had the Braun, whose factory it was, who was located in Milton, which is just north of Frankfurt, had a competition. And the Sterling scheme was actually the second. It didn't win first prize. It was the second uh, scheme in the thing because it was slightly more expensive. But the client was taken by the ideas of it and Sterling got the job, which he did with 
Walter Negley, who had worked with him extensively before for, 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 for many years. So there was an ideas conference in 87, and they started in, in 88, and it was finished in 91, 92, and Stanley died in 1992. Most of what I'm going to show you now is taken from this book I'm showing you the cover of here, which was produced by Walter Nagley and Valbona um, after the building was completed. On the right hand here is, is a coloured diagram of factory, which I'm going to use to refer to it. First thing I'm going to say about it is that it is quite a large scale layout for an industrial building, and, and as such, it mirrors the large scale of the Sandy project which was, it's not quite the same scale, but it is of a similar scale range. And what we have is, because of the industrial processes here, um, we have various elements, like some D had for a city, if you like, uh, that make up the factory, set in a landscape. And I'll go on and explain these a bit better. Here again is the organisation, a, a coloured up organisation of this factory. I'm sorry it's not, not to scale. But basically, what is blue is the line is a production building, which is where they put together the chemicals and the, the, the containers that they're in and assemble them. The volume of production is unknown, so it has to allow for expansion. So what was built initially for the scheme is the solid blue bit, is a production building, but it's located on the, the layout of the plant so as to be able to expand in two different directions as a, a continuous building, rather like a, a very much like an Italian rationalist sort of uh, building that could go on repeating. The pink building, these a series of buildings in pink are, are distribution. They're, once they've produced the things in, in, in the the things are sterile and they're sealed and they move automatically with computer-organized circulation routes um, through a distribution center where there are storage areas of different sizes. So you have one, two, three, four, but there are five or six buildings which are all to do with putting together the packaging and the chemicals before they are collected. This last distribution building is this one here, is where from the outside lorries come in and pick up the, and drive off and deliver the, deliver the product. The red building is car parking. One thing is that this is a factory employing quite a large number of people that is located uh, outside uh, out of a town, so most people have access to it by car. Therefore, it, it had parking. One of the things that won the competition was that the car parking, rather than being spread out on the ground, occupying the is contained in a vertical car park that goes up several stories, but, but contains the volume of cars that you have for the people working and, and visiting. So that's, that's car, and there's a ramp to deal with the car parking there. Yellow is the, if you like, the industrial servicing part uh, for the engineering to make the distribution and the packaging work. Brown is canteen. That's canteen for the workers, separate, a separate building for, to get away from work and, and relax. Green is a garden. This green triangular here area is, because it's set in landscape, is a deliberately, uh, if you like, an English sort of a garden, a garden for sitting and uh, for, for looking at, observing. The orange building, the orange building is a long corridor that links the, the building that I haven't described to you, which is the admin building, which is the end here. The white part, the end here, is the admin, which is where the people administering the factory are, are in an office building, and there is also a, a building for computer. They're, they're in a separate building there. So there is a, 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 cor a, a corridor link with a wall that links to the car park. So if you come by car, you get out of your car, and you link, and you either go off to work or you go off to admin. If you're a visitor to the factory, you arrive at the corner of the site here, where there's entry, if you like, is controlled. Um, exit is at the other end, that there's lorries for distributing, and a link to the railway to the nearest town that comes in, not shown on here, a rail link there. So you, you enter at the site. You enter, <coughs> because it's outside of town by car, by a double road, one of which goes at a, a level that delivers you to the admin building here, which are received by admin. The other, which continues on into the car park, you park and you go off by this route and you go off to do your work inside. That's the organisation of this factory. Here is this in more real terms rather than completely abstract. We're getting to a more more built thing. And I've described to you what quite now, so the, the, the production building here on the side here. Here is the admin building, which is a curved building here, the car park and the distribution stuff. That gives you the scale there of this thing, corridor being about 260 
metres long in size. Again, the, the workings of that, you can see here the, the production building is made up of bays where things are assembled and put together. The distribution, the warehousing bit is both vertical and horizontal circulation. Again, computerised little things that run around and deliver. And the way this is, is done as low level and high level storage is so that you, you, they, they try not to have anything stored on site that's not sold all right, or going off to a hospital where it's going to be used. So uh, when, the order, when they know what they're, they're selling and being ordered, it comes back to here and, and, and it is assembled in the exact quantity. It, it, it's a sort of mechanised um, distribution system. But back to the overall setting of the buildings. Um, here you can see the, diagon the diagram I've shown you with the coloured distribution and the long line of the production part there, which is set against one side of what is a valley. Two valleys, three valleys actually come together. One, two, three. The main town is off, off this way. This way there is a dam that runs across this valley collecting water for the local area. What happens here is that the main distribution thing, which may vary in size, is at right cutting out to the edge of the valley here. And across the valley is this 260 metre long uh, corridor link blocking wall to the car park thing that relates to a dam further down the valley here. There's a small hillock at the junction of these valleys where the land is slightly higher and the admin part is related to that small hillock there. So when I've described the way you come in here, uh, topographically, you're, you're coming uh, valley on either side. What the main part of the factory stuff is all hidden behind this wall that links across here. This again is the same diagram. This is your route coming in, and the green park is there, formal formal park, and the admin building this end, and the canteen at, at that end there. Here's a view of this across before the whole thing was built. There's this small this side here. There's this small hillock in the middle, which is that in plan. And this part here is the hills here rising up above. So you can see the scale of the landscape and the scale of the layout of the factory buildings. They, they, they relate to each other in a sort of, if you like, quarter of an hour walking distance, although you're not required to walk for a quarter of an hour if you don't want to. Um, that there is a scale here uh, that is similar to the Sandy scheme that Corbusier did, but it, this is a, a, a factory, not a, not a city. Uh, here's a view across looking down the valley with the building. Right. The, here is the production building, the two bays of it that are built. Um, this is a farm building that's there. The long wall corridor type building is, is running across here and this rather darker bit is the admin building. You can't see it very clearly with a hillock in front of it and behind are the various heights of the warehouse buildings. So this sort of view you get the, the, the countryside, if you like, with the landscape and the building setting into it. Here we are a bit closer. You can see, again, the wall running across like a sort of a dam across. And I'll go through the sequence of how you come in and out. This is a bit, a bit complicated. There's internal movement within the factory, how things move inside and outside. And I think it's repeating, well, which I've just described to you on the, on the, on the, in, in the coloured diagrams. You can see where the rail link would go in here and all these various things. The, the, as the building expanded, how, 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 it, how it's organised and how it fits together. Right, going in, as you come in from the entrance, this is formerly what you see, there's a concierge at the entrance here, and there are the double roads. So if you're, if you're, if you're a, a, a visitor, you go up to the admin building here. If you're a worker, you go in and under and, and behind and park your car behind here. So the, here you've got what you, you go through in, uh, by car, you go through this laid out landscape. It's laid out with a pond, which is to do with the water for the heat pump for the industrial processes. The, the landscape has, has a pond in it and it has planting within it. You can see growing up as you, as you come in. This is getting nearer again, all right, where the roads split. You can see where you go under, under to work uh, and under to visit. There again, as, as, as you arrive by car, you, you sweep in under Pilotti, if you like, to the entrance and there's this large wall with a car parking behind it and a large rather blank wall but this is car scale and background to the greenery of the park that is to your left in this photo and this is as you're entering the building uh, this is looking back as how you come into it you come into it up on the corner up here on these two roads and this is if you're a guest as I am here having taken this photo we're, we're going to be shown the building so you arrive at an entrance up above the landscape and you can see there beyond the valley and not quite the, 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 the other um, dam that is in the distance over there 
to, and, and to the left here, as you're coming into it, the production part there, and the car parking is below it, and you can see that this is designed as a, as, as a landscape here that you, you move through, and it's for looking at. Broadening out that view as you're underneath it, you've just been looking at this part of it here. You're underneath the, the admin building, held up on its pilotti, and beyond there's a landscape going on there on the other side of it, and you enter off in plan, you enter you entered off this thing here, which I've been showing you views externally, underneath the curved admin building that it is in there, into a foyer. And this is the foyer here, and then above that you rise up to the offices for the admining, and below there's the computer technological center for, for, for administering all the, the processes that go on uh, within, the, within the factory below. A closer up of that as to how you're, 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 you're sort of half joined to the landscape, but you're half divorced from it, with these very strong forms for these Pilotti holding up the admin building, but you're, you're aware all the time of the landscape around what you're within, which is afforded by letting the landscape, landscape flowing through and under, which is a Corbusian thing. The side of the admin building, uh, the computer part underneath it, two views of the same thing. You can see here that the color photos, the, 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 the use of color to break down the scale. The, these sort of pilotti, they're not pilotti, they're these large columns are reminiscent of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Johnson's Wax, you know, look how clever I am as an engineer, you know, to hold my building up on this little thing with this thing underneath it. But it has a certain sort of biomorphic sort of form to it as well as it the curved and shaped as it goes up. Internally, the layout of the building, it, it's curved so you can have movable partitions. Uh, the, the, those are south facing, and the, the two walls are different because of the way the light comes on them and the way you circulate, but it, and services are formed within it. Again, the, 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 the cladding it, the one, some of it's, it's, it's quite depth, deep and done with zinc and coloured patterns too, for you to enjoy of this building sitting in the landscape. Right here underneath the computer stuff that runs underneath, and you can see how it works in section. Now coming to when to go on through, there's this link to this large wall that goes, that where we're in the admin building here, the white bit there. Uh, if you're a visitor and you're a worker, you arrive at this point here. Uh, the real business of the works, of course, is in the production part and in the distribution part. So to go to those, you, you, you're, you're distributed from the car park through a wall at an end here and into this narrow corridor that runs along, a corridor that runs along here, that's running along here, that's running along here, if I can show you at different scales. I'm now going to go up to a bigger scale where you can see what's going on here. The top here, there's an elevation from the car park, because go up car park, if the plant, as it would or could expand, uh, there would be more people coming, so the car parks can come in through and distribute up to this corridor. This is a plan. The corridor as you go along is it varies in width as you go along it and it varies in height as well. So you have a spatial experience of going across past the garden to where you're going to be doing your, your walking. And here's a, a black and white view of what you're doing there. R rather bleak but you can see the scale of the circulation in, in relation to the landscape which is there's that at a, at a longer scale so you've got out of your car and you move along this corridor uh, and from to the various parts in it and this is done by the car park behind this concrete wall that you enter the car park from and this corridor that varies in width in width uh, in width and in, and in height and is supported on these posts that hang off so you've got the solidity of the wall and the transparency of the posts holding up the corridor that you move along through. And there it is varying in width and length, and varying in width and length, and in landscape, and varying in width. So which, as you enter and leave work each day, you have this sort of transitional period before you, you go off home, where you, you're made aware of the setting within which your the building is. Here's the production building at the end of the, of the corridor and some of the planting before it's grown up. Um, a view of that corridor, the, the car park, the concrete wall, the, the corridor, production building. The reverse angle, looking back at the admin building, um, if you're, this is from within the uh, 
the production building. Again, you see the, 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 these forms and how they relate to the landscape. Uh, Sterling and Bob Maxwell walking down that corridor. The production building itself is made up uh, of the processes that go on within it. In section, the top part, I'll come to a drawing. In section, you have a roof. That area you see there is all mechanical plant that runs in that overall cover. Below it here, you have a sealed area where things come together in a stairway, and below that, things which are assembled and then also collected and distributed to go off. The, the building you're seeing there is part of this great long one there that distributes them to the... Here it is in section. The, the, the main, main works go on at this level here, which is a clear span floor space. <coughs> um, plant above, circulation for the workers, servicing the lockers and things. And these are rooms where things are sterilised, assembled, put together. In section, you can see that the, 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 the structure is shown in that way, cross, cross structure that way, the hall, which is the, the pedestrian way of moving through it. The, 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 the span of the building itself is, is, is a marvellous piece of engineering, these this triangular trusses that give you a clear span without any columns so that you can redistribute how you do the putting together of the various things inside it there. This is only two sections that are built, and, and, and looking at it recently, I don't know whether they, they had built more. That's the clear span in which you, you manufacture things. This is the junction between, this is the canteen between the way you, you walk across, landscape behind, where you're making things, which can continue to be big, and the canteen that, that in there. The inside of the canteen that has a vertical space that, that's very nice. I, I did take photos, but I've lost them since then. I'm sure my own photos. This is from books of that. Then there are various parts of the building that do their own mechanical distribution and storage function. You can see here an overhead view. There's the production building that can expand. The big wall that with, the, with the corridor along it on the, the scale, the, the, the car park, the admin building. And here are the warehouse buildings that are quite large, which are screened by these other service buildings. And this is where the railway would, would come in and the building where you, the, you connect on the lorries. At, at, at the end. More detail of that, and you can see the, the forms of these things are, are determined by their industrialised shapes, vertical circulation. Again, the, the structure of this sort of fan-shaped building for different sized, well, lorries are uniform sizes, but, but the loads of them are, 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 are worked out before they, they pick them up and send them off. And again, the, the distribution of lorries building, again, the scale and the shapes of this. I think Stone Coat is being reptilian as this thing, this large thing that sits in the landscape in this lozenge form. The roof, it's clad in copper sheeting like that, again, quite reptilian. Um, here's the railway off to Frankfurt. For the, and and the, the industrial buildings in their landscape expanding out. Um, and... I think I'm going to... I, what I've done is described all this. I mean, I just was going to end on two quotes, mainly one from Sterling as, you know, the, the aesthetic and style for the job. I've shown you here a, a, an architectural school um, and, and, and a factory building, not the type of building that he designed quite a few of, but didn't get to build many of. And a quote from Letherby uh, from an earlier g generation in the 19th century, relating to engineers' aesthetic and buildings and vernacular, which I think is what Sterling was after. And if he'd, perhaps if he'd lived long or had more projects of a different sort, we might have seen some different things happen. Thank you. That's the end of the... I'll just go back to the main stem of his things, which was um, industrialised buildings.